Hello. I don't really think the mic's ready to need it in a room this size. The slides. Don't need to check if they're updated. Yeah. Uh, changing pictures of playgrounds. Yes, it is updated. Awesome. Using kitchen as an analogy instead of music playgrounds. Nice. Could you turn it off that screen up there? Are you here? So uh, I have it set up. So basically, I have like uh, a swap. So I have ten desktops, and so the tenth desktop is just oh, that's that one. So you move it to the tenth desktop. And yeah, I exactly. It. I need to set that up. That's cool. And so, here's your and, 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 and if I click forward, high controls that one. Yep. That's what I was checking. There you go. <clears throat> How are we looking for today? This is the most wide awake. Me too. I'm going to start. <laughs> Sorry. I have to let it happen. <laughs> Just in case you don't know how a battery works. There are people. Uh, okay, I think there we're people. We're looking like. I don't know. We're, we're like really sparse. Have we scared people away? Who oh, may have? Yesterday's homework was hard. I see 33 right now, so we're only five down. Okay. Nope, 34. We're almost done. Who? Kevin. Yeah, that's Kevin. Okay. From the Tejas He's picking up fast. Huh? He's picking it up fast. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. Yeah, he's short. He was a fighter pilot. Oh, good. So. <laughs> it's just everybody in that boat bugs yeah. So we're trying to find a few people who can get bugs. Yeah. Well, I've just been amazed at how quickly Dylan Blab has exploded. Well, you got two R01s out of it. So when I started, it was like a four, three or four grad student lab, and now it's like, you know, ten. Let me see if we can log in. I logged in from home. It's a global IP. I also logged in this morning from home, so. Oh, I never put the link on the website for the... I've got a document with like every field that I want to keep. And I may help have these guys help me fill it out because the problem may just literally link to the Google Doc and edit it in this. There's a lot to find in the process. Okay, that looks full now. We'll be fine. I mean, I assume the getting everyone running past QC is going to be. I mean, you know, I feel like the biggest learning you do in 
programming is the kind where you're beating your head against the wall, <laughs> struggling to get it going. Yeah. Which is like, that's normal. That's like the fundamental part. Yesterday, I tried to prep the outside of the yeah. and I had the wrong slash. And I was, what am I doing wrong? And I had to Google it. I'm like, oh, damn it, I had the wrong slide. You don't see that. Like, you're looking at the slides. Yeah. Yeah, my low point is four hours. The worst bug I've had is also a four hour bug. In that it was a feature counts thing, and feature counts doesn't want any arguments quoted. But nowhere does it actually, nowhere does it actually say, say that. And so, like, if you're following bash by pra best practices and quoting all of your variables, yep. like you said, <laughs> oh my god! And it'll it doesn't give you any descriptive errors. It gives you like some weird binary. Yeah, there was Random one of the programs error. that if you put something in there it didn't understand, it always blamed the, the um, flag afterwards. Yeah. It took me forever to figure it out. I'm like, that flag is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, let's get started. Okay, today. Oh, wow, clicky. Today we are going to be talking, we're going to do the capstone first, but then we're going to be talking about supercomputers, permissions, creating an SBatch script, and submitting an SBatch script. If you don't know what that means, that's okay, because we're going to show you that. Make sure to do your homework. Who here had a hard time with yesterday's homework? I don't know anybody who didn't. We did that on purpose, because this is what it really feels like when you're in the middle of coding. When you were like, I need to get this out of this file, and I think it's, oh, it's easy. I just need to get this out of this file, and it's four steps long. That's pretty normal. And you struggle with just figuring out the steps. So typing is not the problem. It's the number of steps and what steps do I need. Okay, so remember today to do your, if you did not finish yesterday's homework, I would say go back and do it. Because you will get better at bash and dealing with the command line, and if you don't get better at that, it will make next week really hard. Okay, videos. Day four is your homework, and then we're going to create some SBash scripts and run them. What is SBash scripts? Well, first we're going to talk about what is a server. So um, servers are com lots of computers all tied together. That's the simple explanation. And because you're going to be dealing with mouse or human data or some sort of organism that has lots and lots of genes in it, lots and lots of nucleotides in it, you're going to need a supercomputer, um, also called a server. Uh, a lot of your stuff's going to take a lot of space and memory, and supercomputers are generally run on Unix or Linux. <laughs> Robin made the joke that this is, have you ever seen that thing that says manual cars are um, security for millennials? <laughs> because most millennials can't drive a manual, they can only drive an automatic. That's like servers. So they're built on Linux and Unix, and therefore only, buddy, only people with some Linux or Unix can actually drive on them. Um, so it's a little bit of a protection. It's also because Unix and Linux are the languages of coders. If you want to build something quick, it will be in Linux or Unix. It will not be on Windows. Okay, installing is often a pain. This is where I tell you your IT matters. So probably your campus has a supercomputer. Your IT actually matters because they're the ones trying to get stuff to install. It is not quick or easy to install bioinformatics programs most of the time. Um, it is also a problem you've probably never run into before where programs will collide with each other and not necessarily work well with each other. So IT is essential. They will be building the playground you will be playing on. If you are on, the, I'm going to put a document up that tells you on each campus which supercomputers are available. I only have the information for Anschutz and um, Boulder. So if you know of other universities you're at and you would like to add the information on which supercomputers you guys have, um, come find me and we'll put your guys' information on there too so that future people know what supercomputers are available on each of the campuses we're teaching to. Okay, you guys up till now have been playing on your laptop. Your laptop is like your backyard playground. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to share it. Maybe you have to share it with your siblings, but not much. You can go on the slide whenever you want. You can climb whenever you want because it's your backyard playground. 
you are about to move to a public playground. That is our server. And our public playgrounds are bigger and they have more accessories in them. But it also means all of you will be on the same playground. So a big part of today is learning to play nice because you've never had to play nice on your own backyard. So you're gonna have to learn how to do it properly. There are a couple of words you're gonna hear a lot. We're gonna talk about what they mean just before we start. Head node. The head node is what you are actually logging onto. It controls what is going on on the supercomputer. It is not actually where your scripts are gonna be running. So your scripts are gonna be running on something either called a child node or a compute node, it's mean the same thing, okay? So the head node's what you're logging into, but it is not where you're running commands. Up until now, we've been running commands on the head node. Small commands like ls and head, that's fine to run on the head node. But the stuff we're gonna teach you to run tomorrow, boss QC and high set, you don't run on the head node. We'll talk about why. Okay, compute nodes. Node is a term for something that has lots of CPUs, also known as processors, also known as end tasks in the scripts you're about to use today, okay? So they are not exactly the same words, but they will be used closely enough that you need to remember they're pretty much synonyms, not exactly. CPUs, end tasks, processors, okay? Okay, when you submit a job, it actually matters how much memory it takes, how much time it takes, how many CPUs it takes. You've never had to deal with that before because you've been running on your own computer. All of that goes on under the hood. You never have to tell a program how much memory or how many CPUs to use because it's just automatically figured out on your PC. It is not automatically figured out on a supercomputer and therefore we're going to need to tell it how much space, how much time. Why do you need to tell it how much space and how much time you're going to be using? Yeah. Other people. There are other people in this room. <laughs> okay, so if you tell the head node that I need 32 CPUs and then you use one of them, that's like the little kid who says, I want the whole playground to myself, nobody else can play on it. Not very fair, right? Then you get beat up on the playground. You say you can beat up on the playground, exactly. The other possibility is that you say, I just need one CPU. And then you come in with 32 kids and take over the entire playground. What happens to that playground if you have requested one CPU and you take up 32 of them? Any ideas? Now someone comes in behind you and needs one. They can't use it, you're already using it. So this is where we're gonna have to play nice because the top half of your SPAS script today is all gonna be about what do I need and how much do I need and how much time. And if you don't do that correctly, you actually generally don't screw yourself, you screw everybody else in the room, okay? So you're gonna have to be careful with the top half of that script because if you get it wrong, you're screwing somebody else, okay? What do I mean by the top half? You're going to build a script. It's very similar to a shell script. The only difference, because you guys have been building shell scripts, right? This part of it, how do you do the glowy buttons? Okay, there we go. This part of it is what you've been running in the shell script so far, the command. And it doesn't matter what that command is, it's just a command that you're going to run. This part of it tells what do you need in order to run that, okay? We go back to our picture. Let's see if I can just do it this way. Yeah, I'll let you deal with that, Zach. Okay, so you're going to build that script. Sfatch command is going to push that script onto a place that the head node can go, okay, these are all of my playgrounds. You need one with a big slide and a small sandbox. Okay, you go there to that playground, okay? So the head node's only job is to pass your script to the right computer to do it, okay? Is it working yet? Yeah, it should be. Okay. There's another analogy. So, so, so. Hang on, Mary. Okay. Go back. There's another analogy. The, the, the queue, the head node, is the major D at the restaurant. You're going to walk in and say, how many people you've got? They're going to sit you at a table that's appropriate. And if you say you've got 20 people and two people sit down, they're going to be pissed. 
<laughs> and if you say you've got two people and 12 trucks, you're going to be standing on the tables in each other's laps. And the next people that come in will not be allowed to get in because you're there. So the top half and the bottom half of your script, even though the bottom half is actually what you're doing, this has no clue what you're doing. It just need, knows how much space and how many people you got. That's all, it's got. that's all it knows. Okay? Okay, you're going to take this, you're going to give it to the head node. The head node is going to put it on one of the child nodes. How can you check on it once you pass it off? That's what this is. SQ, dash U in your username. I'm checking on the script I gave you. Is it still running? Is it done? Is it dead? <laughs> Did it die as soon as it walked in the door? And then the other one, if you ever figure out you screwed something up, S cancel with the number of the job is going to kill it. Okay? What does this matter? Okay. You see this dude? My kids would like that. They crawl all over me. If I'm the one in charge of passing out jobs and my kids are crawling all over me, I'm not very good at doing it, right? This is what happens when you run something like high set on the head node. Suddenly, high set is so busy dealing with the fact that you gave it some, or sorry, not high set. The head node is so busy dealing with the fact you gave it high set to run that it can't handle anybody's jobs, okay? So when you log in, you are on the head node. Do not run commands that are memory or uh, space intensive on that head node. You put it into a script and you submit it to the head node. The head node gives it to a child and the child can get it done. Okay? So head node is what you come into. Don't type big commands on the head node. I'm going to say that a million times because you screw everybody else on the entire supercomputer when you do that. <laughs> the IT guys will get mad and they'll email you and tell you not to do that anymore. Okay? So even though we've been having you type as soon as you get in, once you're on a computer computer, that's pretty much done. Unless you're doing tiny things. So LS is tiny, head is tiny, more and less they're tiny. Things that we're about to run, class QC, high set, not tiny. Okay. okay. Again, red and green sticky notes. If you don't have them, we will pass them back out. A lot of what happens today is going to be like the homework was last night. You're on your own. We're here to help you drive. Yes, that's uncomfortable. That's normal, and we're doing it on purpose because when you get to your you know, uh, lab and you're trying to run this by yourself, this is the part you need help with. It is not the type LS like we did. You don't need help with that. Okay, I'll pass the notes around and let Zach take over. Fantastic. Get my beautiful slides all set up. Ready, 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 down here. Oh, Mary, did you want to show this last slide? Oh, then you can. So this is the pathway. Again, we are not yet on the pathway. We talked about this pathway before, we this entire pathway. We're still not on the pathway. We are trying to teach you guys how to drive. And then tomorrow, we actually get on real roads. So by the end of the day, you've got to know how to move around Linux, Unix, and that path. Because we start running real programs tomorrow on real day. Alrighty, does everyone have sticky notes? Is everyone all situated? Okay, awesome. So, first things first, Mary Allen and I are teaching today. These original slides are from Jonathan DeMassey, who was in IT. And these slides are really good, so we're just going to go ahead and reuse them. Today, we're going to be talking about the supercomputer in a little bit more detail. At the start of this talk, we're just going to go over a couple of special things you need to know about the command line that we didn't quite get to yesterday. And then we will review the basics of working on a supercomputer like Mary Allen was talking about. And then we're gonna have you build a script from scratch to submit a job to the supercomputer and actually do some analysis.
So today, there's a few things that we're going to try and understand. First, we want to understand why we're using compute clusters and why they're important. We're going to learn how to get data to and from our local computer and onto the server. We will figure out how to actually download data. So a lot of the time when you're looking at your own data, you might want to compare it to, say, past experiments. So it's really important to be able to know how to download publicly facing data. There's a lot of databases that are available. And here it's worth mentioning that in the bioinformatics world and just computational biology more generally, open data is a really big deal. So whenever you're doing an experiment, whenever you're doing something that's actually going to be submitted to publication, you are going to have to upload the data that you generated to a public facing database so that other people can go and download it and try and replicate your results. So making sure that your analysis is reproducible by using things like the scripts we're talking about today is going to be incredibly important if you want to get any sort of publications out of the data that you're working with, which I assume that you all do. We're also going to actually go ahead and submit a job to the scheduler and look at the output. And then most importantly, which we've been working through on the past couple of days on the command line, but figure out when something goes wrong, why it's actually going wrong. <clears throat> it bears mentioning here that probably the most important skill that you can develop when you're working in this kind of environment is the ability to troubleshoot and look up your problems. So if you have a job fail and you see an error code, you can go ahead and copy the error code into Google and read through the first few results, see if there's anything incredibly obvious that could have gone wrong. And by slowly doing this over time and slowly developing your troubleshooting skills, you'll be able to get really quick at resolving these issues because there's a lot of common ones that come up all the time. So let's get into it. So first of all, does anyone have any questions about the videos last night? Any thoughts, comments, anything that you'd like me to answer before we really get into it? If you didn't figure it out, by the way, this is a homework last night. I don't know if we talked about that up there. We did. Um, when you unzipped the homework bar, there was a solutions.shell in the same directory. So if you can't figure out the answers, they are in solutions.shell. But don't cheat if you haven't done it yet, because the whole point is that you get good at this so that you're able to do what we do next week. If you're really stuck, go look at the solutions to figure out how to get it. Anyone have any questions? Okay, awesome. Well, if you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand whenever. Don't feel bad about interrupting. So we're going to do a brief review of what Mary Allen already talked about and go into a little bit more detail. We'll do a review of JavaScript and SBatch headers, the kinds of things that were in your videos from yesterday, and we'll talk about the module system. Then we will, I'll show you how to download some public data using publicly available tools, and then we'll get to the practice, which is going to be the bulk of today. So the first thing we're going to cover right now is permissions in a little bit more detail. So Ariel talked about this a little bit yesterday when talking about shell, but now that we're working in a shared group environment, understanding permissions are really important. So does anyone have any idea why we want to be able to restrict the permissions that we have on our files? Yep. That's a and a data file. You want them to be able to read a data file, but never write it. Yep. So that's the biggest Including use. Including yourself. Like you don't want yourself to be able to write it on accident. Yep. You want to prevent yourself from doing something stupid because you don't want to blow up months of research by running one bad command. So managing permissions well is really important. The other use case, which is the really, really common one here, is since we are working on a shared system where there's tons of labs and tons of different people working on the system at once, we want to be able to constrain everyone to their own little group where we can only see the data and projects that we're working on. And we can't go out and touch other people's data and write other people's data because in the case where maybe there was someone who was really upset about their PI doing something bad or just... That really happened. Yeah. There was a guy who had full root permission access to the computer, got upset. When he graduated, the day after his graduation, deleted everything. that time after his defense. Oh, gosh. He logged on the machine, deleted everything, and then went to the <laughs> And was never seen or heard of again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he had published 22 papers as a graduate student. He deleted everything. And 
took the lab project six months to a year to just rebuild their go to one step. So permissions are really important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so do, you, do you think you can read it? Yeah, yeah. Back. You can do that from permissions. So there is a command called uh, chmod, so chmod. And that will let you go ahead and change the permissions on a file. So if you wanted to, say, make it so that the file is not writable, you would do chmod minus w and the name of the file. And that minus is going to say, OK, I don't want this to be writable. If you want to make it writable again, you can do your chmod plus w, and that will make the file writable. So writable would include deleting it? Writable would include deleting it. So if a file is not writable, you will not be able to delete it. But like, say, you You'll be able to move it. Like make you should be able to make a copy. You will not be able to move the file. Okay. So if you ls into scratch shares, we could actually show them that yeah. those files are readable, and you guys are allowed to copy them. However, you guys are not allowed to write to them, so that nobody can delete them. <laughs> yeah. Let me get a terminal pulled up. So now that you know how to read them, you should be able to ls l on any of the or any of the files we've looked at so far and read what their permissions are. Okay, so scratch shares public and s read. Yep. So now if you do ls l. So we can see here that like we were looking at before. Uh, all of these files are, actually, these are all read-writable. So. Read-writable by me and by the group, but not by you guys. Yeah, so you can see this last flag. We are not able to write on these files, and Mar only Mary Allen can edit them. And we can see here that Mary Allen is the user that owns these files, and because of the way the group is set up, Mary Allen is also the group owner. So the group thing is an important thing to note as well, because if you're working in a lab, the typical way this is set up is that your lab is a group. So everyone in your lab will belong to the same group on the computer. And so this second column here, this RWX right here, will define the column or will define what people in your lab can do. So very frequently it'll be you will own your file, maybe uh, other people can read it but not write it inside your lab group, and then nobody else can see it if they're outside your lab group. It's a pretty common use case for this. And so, let's see. So if I change back to my home directory, let's just make a... Yeah, I can do that in just a sec. I don't, you're probably in Tati's group, too. Yeah, I am. That would be good, because you'll, you'll be in more than one group. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I have all sorts of weird group permissions because of all the collaborations. So. Yeah, me too. I've, I've got five groups I'm in, because I'm in so many collaborations that I have to be in other labs groups as well to be able to see their files. Yeah, I think I'm also on Parker's whatever group. Anyway, so what I was going to show here is... I went ahead and created a file called my data. It's a really important file. And so if I was, say, doing something really dumb, I could say, hey, look, I don't need this file anymore. This is my source data for my experiment. Oops, it's gone forever. <laughs> so uh, if I go ahead and look. 
at the permissions here, I can see that I've got read write, write permission on all of these here. And so what I'm going to do here is I can just do my. You don't have to have the same file. You can have any file you want to load that you can test it. Yeah. So we, I'm going to remove the write permission on this file. And then if I go, I can see, hey, look, now this file is not writable. So now my file is nice and protected. So if I go, it's going to be like, hey, do you really want to remove this? And so, so you do have permission to do it. You just have to type the word yes there. And it's a, like, catch yourself before you accidentally do something stupid. Yeah. So it'll throw up all these big warning flags saying, hey, you probably don't want to do this because this <laughs> isn't writable. And then say I want to make it writable again for whatever reason. I can go plus w my data. And hey, look, or hey, look, now it's writable again. So that's really the most important version of changing permissions that you're going to need for when you're working with your data. It's just, I have my data files. I'm going to make it so they are not writable. Yes, Ariel? Uh, so you're, you're, you just plus w and then that change permissions for two weeks. Yeah. Is it possible to change for only one set? It sure is. It's possible to do all of them. So, so under the additional material, there is a permissions link, and that tells you how to change oh. permissions any way you want. So, on the file, you can't change that is true. so maybe I want to make it so I can't do it for my group. I can do my data. So G says group. Oh, wait. It's been a while since I've done this. Normally. I always use the numbering system. Yeah. Uh, option. Five is, uh, so Chimo can be used by these little letter flags, but they also use the numbering system. And you can look up Chamo's table on Google, and it will tell you the number for any combination you want. Yeah, so for example, this, I just know this because I've done it a bunch, but this Chamo 600 is going to say that uh, the first number represents user, the second number represents group, the third number represents, uh, what's the it? World. Yeah, the world. And so I know, I just know this, that 600 is going to make it so that my file is read-write only for me. And so if I go ahead and do that, and I do, then, hey, look, it's read-write for me only. I like 755, my favorite number, because 7 means I'm allowed to do anything, but you guys are only a read, allowed to read and execute. And my group is only allowed to read and execute. The numbers represent, do you have any rules or whatever? Yeah. about the binary, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no? Yeah. So one, zero, one, two. But honestly, you don't need to know any of that. Just Google Chamo's table, and it will give you the number for what you want. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm like, okay, which one do I want? That one. You do 755. I often do 755. Or 555. Yeah, so the way it works under the note is this R W X. This is one, this is two, and this is four. And so say I want to do read plus write, read plus write is equal to two, which is six. So because this is a binary representation, every possible representation is unique, of like all the things you can do. Again, you don't actually have to know how to do this math. Just Google Chimo table and yeah. you Just Google it, and they'll give you the answers. But knowing that the command exists is Yes, knowing how important. we got to the number six is kind of useful. Yeah. Okay. And, and you see why seven means everything because four plus two plus one makes seven. Yeah. So then we're going to go ahead and take a look at Fiji. Can you do one more thing actually? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, you can do it on Fiji, but try try and try and change permissions on a file you don't own so they see what oh, it yeah. says. So scratch uh, shares. Black one. There, the readme. Change permissions on the readme. All right, so I'm going to say uh, 
oh no, I can't change the permissions because I don't own the file. So they'll tell you, hey, you don't have permission to do this. What are you doing? So you should catch yourself on reading this ls-l and make sure you can read the permissions, read who the owner is, and read who approved it. Because you will have to do that at some point. Awesome. Oh. It's also a good idea for a lab that has a lot of computational users to have a document that notes what everybody's username is. Because then when you hit a file, you can figure out who the heck owns it. <laughs> so I'm logged in now to Fiji. My prompt, you can see, looks a little bit different. There are ways to customize your terminal prompt, which we won't go over today. But if you have, want to make your terminal prompt pretty, shoot me an email and I can send you. <laughs> Some ways to do that. But uh, what did you want to show on PG? Oh, yeah. Oh, something about the download file. Just so they can see what it. And then groups, the command groups. Because the command groups on the AWS with which we do view is everybody in here doing in their own group and there are no subgroups. Yeah, so we can see that, for example, here in our Dow Lab Scratch group. We've got some files that are, say, owned by me, but belong to the Dow group. So anyone in the lab can go ahead and look at those. And we can see that all of them are not writable. And you also see that a lot of different people own files in yeah. this directory. We can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different people have files in this directory. And, and so- you know why you need to keep a record of who the people in your lab are? Who the heck is IGTR48? Ignacio. Yep, that was Ignacio. We can name all the people over there because we've had to deal with their identities enough. Hey, that's me. Uh, Type groups real quick. Too. Yeah. Okay, so generally you will be in only one group. However, because we collaborate, Zach is in. I'm in the Dow Lab, I am in the Spencer Lab group, and the Tejas Lab group, and I am also in the IQ Bio group for the 2020 year. So I'm actually part of four different groups. And if you're someone like Mary, you can have a ton of groups. Yep, that's, that's all I want to show. Okay, the awesome. Because the groups thing, like I said, on AWS doesn't make any sense. If you guys Oh yeah, the last thing to note is that this uh, D at the beginning of the permissions is the director, whether it's a directory or not. So if it says D, it's a folder. Otherwise, it's a file. Also, the coloring, you guys kept asking what makes the different colors when you LS. That permission is exactly what changes the color. So you will get used to seeing if something is an executable or not an executable, and whether it's a directory. Yeah, so like I made a folder and so that folder is colored blue. Wow, so cool. <laughs> Alrighty. Back to our regular scheduled programming. So then uh, this is a text dump. This is mostly for you to download the slides later and look at in case you need to uh, know some special characters that are involved in Bash. So the thing to know about Bash is because it's a programming language, there's a lot of characters that have special meaning that you should not use for things like variable names or uh, other stuff. Because if you do names. use them, file names, yeah. yeah. Put them in file names. So if you do use them there, it's not gonna work. So the dollar sign is an important one we looked over yesterday that represents the start of the variable. So if I say like dollar sign user, That'll bring up my username because that's set by the environment. And so you can have all sorts of these variables that you have in your shell scripts, but dollar sign will always go ahead and uh, try and capture a variable. So, um, so one standard practice we didn't put on here, but it's important, is if the computer names a variable, it will almost always be all caps. Yeah. So user is a computer named variable. Whereas when we made a variable, you should use small letters so that you know it's your variable. So when we set A to 5, that was our variable. And it's not required, but it is good practice. Yep. So then uh, it's important to note there is a distinction between double quotes and single quotes. So if you wrap something in single quotes, it's not going to do anything with variables. It'll say this is just plain old text. 
if you do it with double quotes, it's going to actually expand all the variables inside your double quotes. With the star character, this is the one that's probably the most important and most useful on this slide for what you're going to be doing. So if I have like, say, eight different files that are all, say, FASTQ files that I want to do some analysis on with a single function, I could write out each of those FASTQ file names one at a time in my command. Or I could just go and say, okay, I want star.fastq. And that will say, okay, in this directory, I want every single file that ends in .fastq. So that's a really powerful, useful tool. Although star out of the box does not work in a script. You can't force it to work in a script. Yeah. But it does not work in a script. Yeah, expansion is. Fashion is a great programming language. It's got a lot of cruft. And here we talked about this hash sign. We'll talk about this more later, but it starts a comment. So anything after that will not be executed as part of the script. But we do use it for sbatch direct loops. Then we've got all these different utilities that we use for pipes and control flow. These are more for intermediate or advanced scripting. We'll cover them a little bit. And the last really important thing you need to know is that if you do want to use any of these special characters or any other bash special characters in your script for some reason, you can go ahead and use the backslash. So if I say backslash dollar sign, it's just going to be an actual literal dollar sign. So if I had a script where I was talking about money, I would just put backslash dollar sign anytime I was talking about an actual dollar sign value that I want. Did anybody use the backslash yesterday in homework? What for? So, so one of the things we asked you guys to do was to find all the lines that start with a dollar sign. So you can grab or serve not with dollar sign with a um, hashtag pound sign. So you can't cannot grab pound sign that is. So what do you do? That's right. Backslash escapes the fact that you're not supposed to be able to grab a pound sign. Yeah. Sometimes that will work and sometimes it will not, depending on the program. It should almost always work if you use single quotes. If you use double quotes, it would not work. That's a distinction that matters for Bash because of some historical stuff. The thing to know about Bash, which sort of informs all of these weird sharp edges, is that it's really old. <laughs> so the original version of SH was developed along with Unix back in the olden days of the 70s and 80s. And everything since then, so Bash is just like an improved version building on the original shell from way back when they first developed Unix. So it's really, really old. And so there's just all that accumulated legacy. It's like when you have a really long project and you just keep getting like these weird random bits of data that like, I don't really know what to do with this, but I did an experiment, so got to keep it around. So the important thing to remember from this slide, if you can't remember what one of these symbols is, you have to Google special characters in Bash. Yep. Because you cannot Google a greater than sign. It does not work. <laughs> yep. So Google special characters in Bash and you will get a list of these. And then you'll find out what its name is, and then you can Google its name. Yeah. And all of these, the slides are online, so you can go ahead and download them. I know this is a pretty text dense slide. So let's move on to compute clusters and talk about our arrangement here at CU as an example. So like Mary Ann was talking about, we work on a compute cluster here, which has a head node and some compute nodes. So one important thing to know about compute nodes is that compute resources are uh, narrowed down and designated to a group. So depending if you're on something like research computing, you'll have access to specific kinds of compute nodes and specific resources there. On Fiji, the way we have it set up is that everyone who's a Fiji user has access to all of the resources, but that is not always the case. So the distinction between different kinds of compute resources we have here are both in terms of the length of jobs you can run and also in terms of the kinds of computational resources you have accessible. So we have, for example, short and long nodes on Fiji. The short nodes are for any jobs that are less than 24 hours, and the long nodes are for anything longer than that. And I forget what the cap is for the long nodes, but. 96 hours. 96 hours. And then they have another one for even bigger yeah. time sticks. So if something you're running is going to take more than 24 hours, you're going to want to use your long node. 
And in addition, we have some special node types that have different hardware. So your short and long nodes are pretty standard. 32 cores, 128 gigs of RAM. So 32 cores, 128 gigs of RAM that you can request whatever amount you need from there. But we also have dedicated high memory nodes and GPU nodes. So, so oh, go ahead. We're not going to show you this on the AWS, because on the AWS there is one type of node. It is called compute, and that is the only type of node. Yep. That is not normal on a supercomputer. Normally on a supercomputer, this node does that, that node does this, and so they are different nodes. You should know the command S info. When you get your, um, today on the website, there's something called Slurm Cheat Sheet. S info is the one that tells you what nodes are on your supercomputer. So you'll only have to run it the one time to find out what nodes you have, but you have to know for your supercomputer because that changes depending on the supercomputer. If you type it on the AWS right now, it will tell you compute because there are only nodes. And so, for example, on Fiji, we have dedicated high memory nodes that go up to, is it a terabyte? It's, it's big. I don't yeah. remember what it is. A I've terabyte of RAM, or it's either 512 gigs or a terabyte of RAM, but a lot of memory for if you're doing something really big. There's some computational tasks, like if you're doing genome assembly from scratch that need a lot of memory, and so you can use the high memory nodes there. And probably of interest for some people in this room, there's also GPU nodes. So if you're doing any sort of, like, neural network machine learning things. You can use the GPU accelerated nodes to really speed up your jobs. And additionally, uh, there's a pretty good amount of image analysis tasks that can also be sped up on a GPU if you're willing to farm it out to something like Fiji or another computing resource. Can I poll you guys? Um, who here is already on a supercomputer other than the AWS where you're taking class? Okay, so not a ton of you, okay. So this may not come up until you get on a supercomputer. Once you get on a supercomputer, go back to that Slurm cheat sheet so that you know how your supercomputer is set up. Yep. So like Marianne was talking about, we really, really, really need to be careful on the head node. And this seems like we're being really repetitive, but this is a point that really, really matters. If you do something stupid on the head node and the head node crashes, you're going to be making a lot of people really cranky. <laughs> We've had situations on Fiji where people have done stupid stuff on the head node and it's gone down for 24 or 48 hours, which means that nobody in our entire institute can do anything on our compute resources for that entire time until IT is able to fix it. So if you're the person who screws it up, you're going to be uh, letting a lot of people down. Now. Oh, awesome. So just be careful there. It's really easy to toss something into a SBATCH script and run it on the compute resources. And we have so many compute resources available. It's a massive amount. And they're really fast, they're really good. The nice thing about Fiji and most research computers is that they're also hooked up to a dedicated ultra high speed storage on their scratch, uh, scratch storage mount. So anything you're doing there is also going to be way faster reading the data than it might be on your local machine. So compute nodes are great. They're kind of dumb because they're just hanging out waiting for you to tell them what to do, but they are really, really powerful. So on Fiji in particular and on a lot of compute uh, nodes now. Or what number is it? I think it's up to like 90% of supercomputers have Slurm at the yep. top. There are other job managers, but 90% of supercomputers, and everybody who's on one in the class has talked to me, their supercomputer uses Slurm. Yeah. People like their open, semi-open source. It's one of those corporate backed open source products. So. But anyway, there's also uh, PBS or Torque, which is what? Uh, used to be on the Fiji. Used to be before it was Fiji. Uh, back in the Panda days, but. Uh, yeah, so Slurm is really common. Slurm is what we're gonna be teaching today. And what Slurm is, is it's just a program that manages all of the complexity that we're talking about. So it tells you, okay, here's some commands to submit some jobs to the compute nodes, tell it how many resources you need, and then it goes ahead and when you submit your job, it says, okay, here's some spare space on this node in the cluster, I'm going to submit the job there, 
it will also try and efficiently arrange things so that, say, you know, I submit a job that only uses half of a node and someone else submits a job that uses half of a node. They'll say, okay, these two jobs can go and live together on the same node so that we're optimally using the resources we have available so that the most people can use the cluster at once. So sometimes you will become limited on your jobs and depending on the availability of the cluster, if the cluster is really busy or you have some quotas that are established by your PI or whatever else, depending on your system, then you might not always be able to get on immediately. Fiji is pretty fast about this, and usually it doesn't get clogged up too often unless, uh, say, there's someone who is taking most of the cluster because they really need to finish their PhD or something else, and they get special approval from IT to be a temporary bad a resident. But you can get special permission to take over the line and be part of the class. They do not do that often because we should all be sharing nicely. But if there's an emergency deadline, IT can make you priority so that all of your stuff runs before everybody else's. Yeah. IT is great. Last year, they, or in 2019, they taught this whole lecture, but yeah. they're short on resources, so we're doing it. So compute clusters are really powerful. So the amount of resources you have available to you on something like Fiji is far in excess of what you'd be able to buy on a consumer machine unless you're willing to spend like 10,000 plus dollars and even then you'd only be getting the compute power of what you a single node. And we also have, or another advantage is that because we have a dedicated IT team managing it, you don't have to do your own troubleshooting for actually keeping the system up. IT will keep the system up and running at all times. And it's really easy to get more resources when you need it, but not have to have a computer just sitting completely idle. The other nice thing about having a dedicated IT team manage it is that they're going to keep on top of all of your security updates and make sure that all of your software is also updated as needed. So that's great if you need it. And they also will manage the backups for your data. So if you are or if you're storing your data in a backup place, they're gonna be following the absolute best industry standard storage practices for backups. And I guess this is a good time to mention that if you have any sort of experimental data, no matter what kind of science you do, you should make sure that you have some backups somewhere that are offsite and or not vulnerable to natural disasters locally. It's really important to have that because we don't wanna be in the situation where, oh crap, my laptop crashes. There goes all of my PhD research because I only stored my PhD and my thesis on, or my entire thesis on my laptop, and now it's crashed two days before I'm defending. So make sure you have backups. It's independent of this presentation, but. When I was a graduate student, one of the more senior graduate students in my lab was working on computational lab. He was working on a very large computational project. He graduated, he went to move across country for his postdoc. The only place he had his work was on his laptop, and he was in a car accident on the way there, and the laptop was just. Backups are important, even if you're not a dedicated <laughs> computational person. Again, this is dependent on your supercomputer, which is why we don't go over backups too much, other than to mention you should have them. On Fiji, because that's the one that most people, well, I don't know, the highest number of people in this room will really choose, but the fourth of you. On Fiji, there are backed up locations. There are not backed up locations. Know which ones are backed up. Same thing for whatever supercomputer you end up on. Talk to your IT, find out which places are backed up and which places are not. Don't lose your data. Your PI will be upset and you'll also be really upset. So, Or if you're a PI, you will be extra doubly upset. <laughs> I, we actually, we, Robin and I did have a student once who had her um, year of work on a place that was not backed up and the computer just crashed. And she lost a year's worth of work because he had stuff in the wrong place. Awesome. Have we scared you enough? <laughs> cool. So, running jobs on the cluster. So, this is going to be the bulk of what we're talking about for the remainder of the day, which is these batch scripts. So, they're especially defined format, but at the end of the day, they're just shell scripts like we've been working with for the previous two days in the class. 
So there are text files where you can usually in Bash, you can use other shell scripting languages if you really want to. So you could run an R script in S batch. It'd be kind of funky way to do it, but it's <laughs> feasible. And so the script consists of two different parts. So we have our S batch headers, which tell us what our JavaScript needs to look like, and then commands, which is just your normal shell script, whatever you're actually trying to run on the compute node. And so the new thing that we're going to be covering today is our S batch headers right here. So you guys have already written a shell script with command in it. So what we're going to be doing is heading, adding a top part. And the top part just tells the head node what you need. Do remember, the top part and the bottom part don't actually talk to each other. Okay? The top part talks only to the Slurm manager that's living on the head node. The bottom part talks only to the child. They don't talk to each other. Which means if they don't match each other, the computer's not going to catch it. You're just going to screw something up on the computer. <laughs> ah, that's a great question. You don't. <laughs> so the first time you run something, unless someone else you know has run it, you have no idea. There are some standard defaults, and in that Slurm cheat sheet I have, I tell you the standard defaults. The other thing you should do is you should be reading the manual for whatever program you're trying to run. In this class, we're going to run FastGC high set. There's probably 30 people in this building that have run this. Find one of them and find out how much resources it took. If you are running something that you have never run before, hopefully the manual tells you an approximate how much memory space and time this is going to take. If not, you guess. Okay, you can guess one of two ways. You can guess selfishly, in which case you give it lots of memory and lots of CPUs and everything it might possibly need, which then allows the rest of the room to not use those resources. Or you can guess a tiny. If you go over the time you need, the computer will kill it. If you go over the memory you need, it will not kill it. It doesn't know how much memory you're using. You will kill other people's jobs. And if you go over the CPUs you need, again, you will kill other people's jobs. So the best way to do it, in my opinion, is to give it the estimates, the, the starting points, and then check, you only run it on one FOSQ or one sample. And generally, I pick my biggest sample. So if I'm going to run 20 of these things, I pick my biggest sample. I run it on one of them. And then there's a command in the um, document that says, how do I check what it took? Run it on one, you check what that one took, and then you go back and reset your Slurm stuff so that it's getting the right amount. Generally, I do about 10% 10, 10 more than whatever that big job took. But literally, if no one's running around you before, it will guess. Yeah? Mostly. Our IT guys have padded it. So our IT guys allow you 10% over whatever you ask for, for time. Um, yeah. Ah, that's a good question. It is not measuring the amount of memory you use. It is only reserving the playground for you. So there is no one sitting there watching the playground to find out if you actually use what you said you used. That is your job to properly choose how much you need. And that's why, like I said, I pick one file, I run it on that one file, find out my numbers, and then use that to run the whole system. The reason for that is mostly for performance reasons. If we were like nitpicking every single like compute resource all the time, then you'd have a significant amount of overhead that would mean that this high performance computing resource is all of a sudden not super high performance. If we had to staff every playground with somebody to monitor, it'd be a lot of money and time. So we don't monitor it, it just means you don't play nice with your friends. Now, sometimes we'll notice a trend. For instance, I am I know how to check who's on the node with me. So if my jobs are randomly dying, I will check to find out who's on that node with me and go to IT and say, I don't think the person is asking for the right resources because every time I get on a node with them, my job dies. <laughs> yep. And also, if you do max out the memory on like a whole node, it can kill it. Yes. Yeah. So, like, if you allocate an entire node with all 128 gigs of RAM, and then you somehow are using 128 plus gigs of RAM, 
the node will quit because it doesn't want the node to and they have to get locked up and die. Go to the node and reset it. So the exit is not like this because they're walking to another building and into a basement. <laughs> so that's why it'll kill it if you hit the absolute maximum of your node's memory. Now, depending, unless you're doing some really specific stuff, it should be hard to max out 128 yes. gigs of RAM. Like, I've only done it once and I've been doing this for 10 years at this point. It should also be. If you really have memory needs that higher, even harder to max out the high memory nodes, which has a, like a terabyte of RAM, an atrocious amount. Yeah. So when you're working with the super GPU. So, so I optimize on one file what I'm going to do, and then I go back and run the whole thing on all the rest of the files. And like I said, I picked my biggest file. Because whatever my biggest is, it's not always true, but generally is true, will take the most resources. Remember when we were talking about whether or not you get the same rate a million times? That's when you break that rule. So a, the biggest file may take less of something because if there's a small file that has the same rate a million times, it can screw with the computer and then it can run forever. There is one more thing to know. We're going to ask for stuff in this SF script. Your IT has the power to change it after you submit it. You don't. Once you've handed it to the child or to the head node, you have no power over it. However, IT has power. So we had this lady who submitted a job, asked for 96 hours, because that's the longest it's worked, and it got it. So she went to a longer time period node and submitted it for a week, and it got it. And the next time, she submitted it for two weeks. And one day before it got to two weeks, she emailed the IT guy and says, it's still running. I said, okay, and they gave it another week. And so she checked it a week from then, and it was still running, so they gave it another week. Ended up this script took three months to run. <laughs> but the IT guys are allowed to change what you have asked for. So the IT guys changed it every time and, and extended it until it finally finished. You will probably yes. never have that happen. She got into a really weird problem. It was in the Lightbot lab. And she was trying to do splicing analysis, and there's this one gene that splices literally 10,000 different ways. And so it kept trying to fix it because it was like, nope, no one figured it out yet. <laughs> so the point is, you put it in there, and it, it may die, and if, if you think it's going to die, you can always ask the IT guys to ask to add it. Give them lots of time, though. These poor people do will not want to get up at 1 a.m. to extend your job. Yeah. Be nice to IT. They're understaffed and also they have it hard enough. They have the hardest job around here, so be nice to your IT. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about S batch headers. Everyone's favorite part of the day. So, S batch headers are just lines that go at the top of the script that you're submitting to the cluster. And they tell the cluster, hey, here's the kinds of resources that I want. So the partition one is pretty straightforward. This is which uh, group of nodes I want it to be on. So this could be short, this could be long. For today, it's called compute. This is what we talked about when we said we don't know when your nodes are going to be tall. And so compute is what it's called today. But on your supercomputer, you're going to have to figure out what your node is called. Partition is called. We have this time, which is how much time you want to allocate the job. So do I want it to run for 10 minutes? Do I want it to run for 90 hours? Do I want it to run for 12 seconds? Who's to say? But format is just hours, minutes, seconds. We have memory. So this is how much RAM you want. This could be like 8 gigs, 4 gigs. If you wanted 8 gigs, you would just do 8G. If you want 4 gigs, 4G, etc. Normally, you're working in the gigs range. So just 4 gig, 8 gig, whatever. I have really never used a job that uses less than a gig or more than a terabyte. So, uh, and tasks is how many cores or processors you need for the job. So, this is just going to be somewhere between one and thirty-two on our standard nodes. Job name. You can give your job whatever name you want. It can be my cool job. It can be something descriptive so that when you look at the queue, you actually know what's running. A lot of the time, people give their jobs terrible, terrible names. I would not recommend that. 
because a lot of the time you'll just see like job one, job two, job three, job four, through job 32, and you're like, I don't know what you're running, how long that's going to take. So if I was doing like genome alignment, I would say job name, genome alignment, whatever my genome is, and then I can look at the queue and I'm like, hey look, that's my genome alignment job that's been running for 14 hours. Instead of just being like, oh, what's job 32? Let's go in, let's look at the script. Oh, okay, that's what's running there. So this is mostly for yourself and also helping IT. So if IT looks at the job name, then they can be more informed about maybe what's running. Yeah? What happens if people run the job name? Nothing. How many people you submit? Yep. What's unique about your job is the job number. Okay. And that you will get when you submit it. It will be assigned to you when you submit it. So then uh, there's this mail type piece which you will typically want to leave at all. And what this says is, okay, the cluster is smart enough to send you an email when your job is starting and ending. So if you leave this as all, then you submit it to the queue, the cluster will send you an email when your job starts, and it'll also send you an email when the job ends. What it'll tell you when the job ends is all sorts of descriptive information about, hey, did the job actually succeed or did it fail? Is there anything else you need to know about like why the failure happened if it did fail? And how long did it take? How many resources did it actually end up using while it was running? All sorts of useful things like that, which can help you with sort of dialing in the amount of resources you want to submit your future jobs with. Mail user, this is just your email address. I'd recommend using your university email address. Then here we have our error and output file paths. So these two files are really, really important. Because you're running it on a cluster, you can't just look at what's getting spit out in the command line and say, oh, hey, that's where my error is. So the node, the compute node that you're running on will go ahead and spit out your standard output and your standard error to these error and output files, which are located at wherever you want them to be. And so if your job does fail, and you're like, geez, I don't know why that fails, you can go look at your error file and say, oh, it's because I misspelled my file name and I can't find the file, which happens probably in 90% of the failed jobs I run. And the output, if you have some sort of like descriptive information that comes out while your script or your tool is running, it'll go to this output file. Although some bioinformatics tools are poorly programmed, those will output back to the error file as well because they're bioinformatics people and not computer scientists. And yeah, so this is really the core set of headers that you need for running an SPAT script. Do we have any initial questions? Yeah. Could you explain why reducing the response time to output? Oh yeah, percent J. So the percent J is going to expand to the job number. And so if you are running the same job over and over again, like for whatever reason, then the percent J is going to give it a different file name every time. So your job will have an assigned ID number that's just this increasing number. So on PG, it's like, I don't know, in the millions now. <laughs> but, so your job will be say job 8,900,000, 8,900,000. And 62. And so you can go, my job, uh, 3,908, whatever that number I said was, dot out, and go look at the errors for that specific run. And that's also useful if, say, you're running the same script on a lot of different data, then you can have a separate file for each instance of the job that runs on a different data file. Other questions about this? Yeah. Any of these optional? Most Technically, of all of them are. Most of I think partition is only explicitly required. Nope, that's not even required on. You don't need partition. Not, partition. On, not on PG. So your IT guys can set it up anyway. Most IT guys will set a default for all of these. The only thing that is required, you don't have the shebang up top. I don't have the shebang. No, but we'll get to that. Yeah. When there is a thing called a shebang, you'll see it in a minute. That's the only thing that is actually required most of the time. I think explicitly set them anyway, because you don't know that they're default or what you need. So I explicitly set them all every time. What I do is I build a template as batch, which you guys saw yesterday if you did the homework. So the template as batch has my typical settings, and I just save that in the file, and every time I need to make a new one, I copy the template and start over again. Cool.
So next thing we need to know is modules. So we have a lot of software that we use on our compute cluster, but it would be really slow if, and really inconvenient if we had all of the versions simultaneously installed because different people need different versions. Say I started my project on version 2.4, and now the tool is actually at version 2.6, but I want to keep staying on version 2.4 for publishing a paper. I was going to say, don't matters. change it. If you started on one version of a program, unless you're going to rewrite your whole pipeline, you don't change. Yeah. So using a module system lets us have only the tools that we need of, and at the specific versions that we want. So we have environment variables, which are built into Unix. These are a uh, Unix thing that's on every single Unix computer. You have things like, say, your Python path, which tells Python where all of your Python stuff is. This LD library path, which is used for uh, dynamic linking. That's way outside the scope of this path. And then path, which tells you where the executables that you can actually type in at your command line are. So if you do an echo dollar by path, you can see all the places that your shell is going to look for the commands that you can actually run. And so usually that'll be something like uh, user bin, user local bin, something like that. But we have all these environment variables. And so what the module system does is it can dynamically adjust these environment variables to give you access to more tools. So we only have the modules that were loaded in the session that is active. As soon as we quit out of the session, our modules will disappear and you have to reload them the next time. This module loading system is most useful in our SFX scripts. And so here's the syntax that we use. So module avail will tell you all of the available modules on the node or on any of the nodes. So if you run that on our AWS instance, you'll get a lot of available commands because it's copied over from what we have on DG. Not all of them are installed. We've only installed the things for our class, but it'll show you all the things that we do have available on DG. If you need to load a module, Say I want to load Python 3, I can do module load Python slash 3 point whatever, and it'll go ahead and replace my Python with this new version of Python. Module list says, okay, here are the modules that are actually active. So if I've gone ahead and module loaded a bunch of stuff, then I want to know, okay, what tools are actually active, module list. Module unload is the opposite of module load. Module purge says, I want to start over. I hate this. <laughs> Any questions about these? We'll have a demo later. So let's talk about why your jobs could fail and why you don't want, I mean, you don't want them to fail. You want your science to succeed every time, right? Did we say that 90% of you, your jobs will fail the first time? Yeah. <laughs> so it's bad. <laughs> so there's a lot of sources of error. So the first one is incorrect command line setup and misuse of parameters. So if you mess something up in your sbatch directive, if you mess something up just in your script, then your job will fail because bash is fickle and it will just bail out as soon as it sees an error. If you have incorrect file formats, so say I'm trying to run fastqc, but I run fastqc on a non-fastq file, the tool's going to be like, yo, this doesn't make sense. And go ahead and quit on me. If you have incorrect path designations, so this is one that gets people a lot. If you are writing out your super long path and you have a typo in it, your job will just quit and it'll be like, I can't find this file. And when that error happens, which it happens all the time, I know we had a lot of that yesterday and the day before, just go ahead and make sure that your path is the right spelling and everything first. Because that's probably, I don't know, 50 or 60% of the errors that you'll run into. It's just typos and things pointing to the wrong place. And then, Last thing is an incorrectly set up JavaScript or S batch headers, which I sort of mentioned earlier in terms of incorrect command line setup. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and usually they're pretty easy to debug, although it can get pretty deep at times. So how do we know when a job fails? First, <laughs> if our expected output files are not present or empty, then that means something's gone wrong. If we get absolutely no output when we expect output, hey, that seems like something might not be right. <laughs> the job finishes way quicker than expected, so a really common thing that'll happen if you screw up something in your script 
is that you'll go and submit it and you'll look at the queue and it's like, hey, there's nothing there. Because the job started up, it ran for like half a second and saw the error immediately and it just immediately died. And the time it took you to submit the job and say, okay, is my job running, it just choked and died. And then error messages in your error file. So this is the most useful one. Make sure that your error file points to a real path. This will get people a lot of the time when you are writing the paths for your error files. Make sure that they point to a real directory because if you point it to a non-existent directory, you're not going to get an error file and you're going to be real confused when you try and go there and look at what went wrong. But error messages in your error files are great. They'll help you debug. And if you do have a failed job, there's a lot of ways to troubleshoot it. So like I said, your error files and your log files will show you what happened. Error file captures all of your standard error output. Did we talk about standard error and standard output yesterday? No. Okay, awesome. Well, let's talk about- it, it just didn't tell you what it was. Let's talk about standard error and standard output. So when you're in a Unix environment in a bash shell, there's two different kinds of outputs that you, a program can write to. Your standard error and your standard output. Standard output will be the thing that's redirected if you use your angle brackets. And standard error will just usually print to the command line. I'll let you do some special redirection stuff. So they're separate streams because we don't want error and output to mix when we're using our tools. So it's just designed from the ground up so that you're able to separate those so that you can have all of your messages and your output separately. Although with that being said, programs that are written by Bible permissions, they are terrible at putting error messages in your out and out, out messages in your error. Like yeah. That will happen a lot in bioinformatics software, even though you're not supposed to do that. So always look at both files. Yeah. So log file capture standard out for things that you don't explicitly write out. So if you just were, say, like doing an ls, then standard output is going to capture the output there. Break time. Let's take a quick break, walk around a little bit, and then we're going to get to the interactive portion of today's session. You're actually going to build a script, and you're going to do it yourself, so we're not even going to give you one. Is this a time when I'm allowed to break down? <laughs> That's right. If you're about to do something, you open up.
Okay. Yeah. Because it's just too much. There's a lot of information. Yeah. Well, we're about to go into the interactive portion. Yeah. This one's definitely like the Yeah. Awesome. I've also got a bunch of notes. Okay. Awesome. Like the Fiji Q or Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Portugal. The watch command is a great one. This year? Watch is great. All righty. We're going to get started here in just a minute. Okay. So, does anyone have any pressing questions right now about uh, what we've been talking about? <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, let's get headed into our wonderful interactive portion of today's class. So we're going to have you make a SBAT script to run FastQC. Oh, we'll do that afterwards. Yeah, they can look at that afterwards. Publicly available data. Yeah. I should say publicly queue and show them what to do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, then we can cover those at the end. Yep. Awesome, so a couple last things that you're going to need as we put together the script. So we have our curl command, which will let us download files off of the internet. Some places use FTP, which is a tool you can look at the documentation for if you need to transfer files, but we won't be going over that today. So this curl format is what you're going to need for writing your script. First, we're going to download a file, then we're going to run quality control on it. Download the file using curl, quality control using fast PC. So here's what we're going to do. Need to get everyone logged into the server and go to your home directory, start an SBAT script, and using our day three cheat sheet, write an SBAT script for fast PC. If you already downloaded the cheat sheet, please re-download it because I put on there how to check the uh, memory and CPU of the job. That wasn't there before. So guys, this is what we are giving you, all of it. Your job is to build this thing and submit it to your queue. Well, we do have one more slide. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, let's start on our commands. So here's what we need. Is there one more? Oh, yeah, so this is what we've got. So here's the file that you're going to want to get. Again, the slides are on the website, so you can get that copy and paste it off of there. Here's what you want to run for your command. Here's your version of FastQC that you need. So let's write a SBAT script to go ahead and download the file and run FastQC on it using the syntax. Top is your SBAT stuff. Next is your module loading. Next is your curl. Then is your FastQC. That's all we're telling you. <laughs> Just get started. Go. <laughs> so we'll be wandering around, but go ahead and make your script and get you going. Yeah. We talked about starting with the shebang. Oh, yeah. The shebang, the shebang is on the cheat sheet. So if you read this one cheat sheet, it will tell you what you must put at the top of the script. And in red, it says, this must be the top of your script. Now again, remember, if you did the homework, you know that there's a template in day two. You can go look at the template if you sort of need an idea. But otherwise, you're writing the script. Because this is what you do in real life. And while we're doing that, I'm just going to go ahead and show you this queue. So I'm on our node, and if I do SQ, then hey, look, Mary Allen is running a job. What's my job's name? 
Yeah, because my job is just sleeping for half an hour. So if you can't remember what you're trying to do, you come up to the board, it's written right here. Make a script, script test these things, submit it to the queue. As always, if you're really stuck or frustrated, raise the key. Please, you will need it. Once you've submitted it to the queue, can you, can you pull open the template real quick? The, yeah, it's I need It's under S3 scripts day two. Okay. Is it on Scratch, you mean? Yes, yeah, scratch, scratch shares public S3 2021 scripts. Okay. Day two and then the template. So we're only putting that there for a second. Tells you where your ENO files are. Right? It won't say username, obviously, that'll be your username. You need to go look at those files when you're done. Go ahead and close it because they can't see this. this is freaking cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That way they have to go get it so they don't type it. Just put the queue up there and watch it. Because then we should be able to see when people are actually uh, making mistakes. 
for watching the queue. God, this will show up on the screen. Uh, it's in the um, slide for today. You should go to the website for the slide for today. Here's 2022. I'm just out of it. Let's see if my script works. Yeah. There you go. We should have raced. Should I have you go first? And then... There you go. Running. If you guys want to know how to watch, you see Zach says running. Hit that, that R and then it pops off. That means it's finished. All six. It doesn't mean it finished correctly. It just means it finished. <laughs> All six seconds, that it. I'm so glad I get to be job 30. I know, pink peppers are beautiful. <laughs> job began, job ended. And the job number here is I'm job 30. Hey, there are my emails from Hackathon. No, I'm 29, he was 30. Yeah. Wow. Emails from Hackathon? Yeah. Okay. As a warning, the email will come from Hackathon when you submit. <laughs> he did. <laughs>
Somebody made it on. Woohoo! Yeah, congratulations, you're the first one. <laughs> and it is running. That it is. If you submit and there's a big problem, it'll be it'll pop your name for a five. Make sure that my sample script also is logical. My script uses the same file, so.
Yeah, you don't need that second directory.
Okay, so if anyone's confused on the rsync syntax, this is the way that you would do it. Actually, if you want a nice progress bar, you can add a little. It's not going to like that because that's not a real file, but. If anyone is stuck on the syntax for rsync, that's what you need to use. Because next week we're going to be 
We taught you how to do it today. We did not teach you how to do it right. <laughs> Cleanly, ethically. Just the one web, the extra slide I added on the slide deck. Oh, Your slide, slide deck. deck. Oh, perfect. remember I added that one with the right way to do it. Yes. <laughs> 